Mount Osore, or Osorezan, as it is called in Japan, is near Oma in northern Japan. Because of its otherworldly volcanic landscape, which associates it with the Hell Realms and Jizo Bosatsu, the Bodhisattva of the Underworld, it is one of two well-known mountains where people are thought to go after death, according to Buddhist folklore in Japan. The first time I went there, it was in the New Year, in 1990, and there was so much snow, no taxi would go there, so it was closed. I went there with my Japanese boyfriend at the time. We had traveled by train all the way up to Mount Osore. His family had come from Mount Koya near Nara, which is the other mountain. Mount Koya is famous for its cemeteries and was the center for early Buddhist monasteries in Japan. So my boyfriend had always wanted to go to Mount Osore. We got train passes to ride the slow trains and it took us a couple of days to reach the northern tip of Japan. Thus, we found ourselves at the train station in Oma, Shimokita, on that snowy evening in Japan. And since the goal of our journey was closed, we wondered what to do. We were about to end our journey here when we saw a little vending machine offering ferry tickets to Hokkaido for $10. It excited us to think that we would cross over the strait to visit the island of Hokkaido. We decided to go to Hakodate, the nearest port city, and eat ramen, for which Hokkaido was famous, before returning home again, which at the time was not far from Tokyo. So we got ourselves a ferry ticket to the island beyond. I liked Hakodate so much that a few months later we moved there. I lived there for 17 years, married my boyfriend, and raised two children. Now that we lived closer in Hakodate, one summer not long after, we returned to the small coastal town in order to go to Mount Osore. This time, we successfully reached our goal. Despite the rough volcanic rock slopes and the sulfurous air, Mount Osore is actually very peaceful and beautiful. And it has a lake called Usori, which is one of the most pristine lakes I have ever seen. Its crystal clear waters seem to welcome people to come and wade in its waters. But nobody did, because the lake was not a lake to play in. Piles of rocks, stacked one upon the other, decorated the shore in memory of those who passed and it seemed that the people either did not swim in lakes anymore or it was considered sacrilege. Near the temple to Jizo Bosatsu, people left sweets as offerings to the deceased. Hundreds of crows, almost like the reincarnations of the souls past, were carefully unwrapping the sweets with their beaks while holding them in their claws. I admired the cleverness of the crows. They were fascinating to watch. At the time, we had only the kind of cameras that one buys at a stall, little green cardboard boxes with film inside of them. They were made by Fuji Color. You would take the whole little box to the store and have them discarded and the film developed. Only Mount Osore is famous or perhaps notorious, for many pictures taken there would come out overexposed or tinged with strings of light in strange places. Our pictures were no exception, and when we showed them to our friends, they nodded knowingly. Many years went by, and by 2005, I already had my son and daughter and my own life had taken quite a turn. 
I had become very much fascinated by spirituality. I had in the past years spent quite a lot of time studying the work of Robert Monroe, who was the director of the Monroe Institute, a learning center dedicated to out-of-body experiences, or OOBEs. They had a program called Gateway, which I meticulously practiced. And so it was that during one of these experiences, I suddenly found myself in Mount Osore, sitting on a grassy bank, looking at the beautiful lake with its crystal clear water. I knew it was Mount Osore without a doubt in my mind, even though I had neither been there nor thought about it for a long time. But there was a difference in the scene I saw, for where the piles of rocks had been, there were families picnicking, and lo and behold, there were children and adults in their swimsuits splashing around in the lake. The sky was so blue and the weather warm and inviting, I wanted so much to join them. I felt so drawn to the lake, I stood up and looked all around me to see if there were some way that I could join. The families paid no attention to me whatsoever. It was almost as though they could not see me. And then, nearby, I saw a little mound near the bank, much like a hobbit home. There was an entranceway in the mound. I went up to the entranceway and saw that there were steps leading down into a little shop inside. Guess what the shop was selling? There were clothing racks with swimsuits. This was my ticket to swim in the lake, I thought. The swimsuits looked quite normal, and I thought I would have no trouble purchasing one. But here was the odd thing, because every label I checked was either too big or too small. I am a medium size in America and maybe a large in Japan, but I am quite average. And so, as I searched through the swimsuits, the shop lady came towards me. She was maybe around 60, stoutish, and she looked at me as though she were slightly annoyed. I asked in Japanese whether she had my size, but she did not answer in Japanese. She spoke in Chinese. Luckily, as I had been to China as an exchange student, I understood. Meiyo, meiyo, we don't have your size. Zouba, time to go. And she shooed me out of the shop. So I left the shop and climbed up the steps. And oddly, it was already dark. I found myself on the grassy bank again, but the lake was not in sight. I sat there pondering for a while, when suddenly a crew of ethereal beings arrived in front of me. Again, they paid no attention to my presence. They began lifting their arms up towards the sky, as though raising something from the ground. And I saw huts begin to materialize. They did not stop there, but they kept gesturing and the huts turned into old-fashioned Japanese houses, and then into larger buildings, and even larger apartment blocks. Then the beings pointed to the ground and made a gesture as though soothing something along. I peered into the darkness to see what they were creating, and a pathway followed by a railroad began to appear. Then, Two beings arrived, pumping something on a platform, coming down the track. Things got even weirder. The Drazine platform actually transformed into a steam engine, and then into a gas train, and then into an electric commuter train. 
I was astounded as suddenly a helicopter arrived. It was nearing dawn now, and police cars, ambulances, and a crowd of people began to gather as though waiting for something. And at that moment, I woke up. Even now, almost twenty years later, I remember the dream as though it had just happened. That morning, I had an appointment at the doctor's office. It was almost 10 a.m., and I was sitting in the waiting room, idly watching the large TV on the center wall. Suddenly, there was a news flash. Here is the Wikipedia account of the moment. A J.R. Fukuchiyama line derailment occurred in Amagasaki, Hyogo Prefecture, Japan, on the 25th of April, 2005, at 9.19 a.m. local time, just after the local rush hour. It occurred when a seven-car commuter train came off the tracks on West Japan Railway Company's Fukuchiyama line just before Amagasaki, and the two front cars rammed into an apartment building. The first car slid into the first-floor parking garage, while the second slammed into the corner of the building, being crushed into an L-shape against it by the weight of the remaining cars. Of the roughly 700 passengers on board at the time of the crash, 106 passengers, in addition to the driver, were killed and 562 others injured. Most survivors and witnesses claimed that the train appeared to have been traveling too fast. The incident was Japan's most serious since the 1963 Tsurumi rail accident. I was amazed. It seemed that my dream was deeply connected with this train accident. It could have been chilling. Yet, at the same time, I felt somewhat comforted because I had seen what was happening on the other side even before the actual occurrence. I had been shown Osorezan as the symbol of the other side. Actually, I had had similar dreams about the Sri Lanka tsunami a few months before, and a few months later, when Hurricane Katrina occurred in New Orleans, which was the same year in August, which I hope to write about. The later Katrina dream revealed to me why it was that the woman in the shop spoke to me in Chinese. The same idea was presented in that there were swimsuits for sale, except it was an outdoor market along a river in New Orleans, and the sellers were Korean. Clothing in the U.S. was often made in Korea at the time, and many of the clothes for sale in Japan were made in China, thus the Chinese shop lady. Here were details embedded in these experiences that I would have a hard time making up. In my dream, I had witnessed the preparation of an accident site that would look almost identical to the one near Amagasaki. The other side knew what was happening and was preparing to integrate the newcomers, meaning those who did not survive the wreck. What struck me was that in the news they were talking to some of the survivors who had been on the train, and most said that they felt the train go faster and faster, and something had happened, but they had passed out, missing the actual event. Many survivors reported regaining consciousness to see bodies strewn about them and ambulances and police cars arriving on the scene. I remembered too Edgar Casey, who could see auras reporting an incident where the cables of an elevator he almost rode snapped, sending the passengers to their death. He had politely refused to ride because he saw the people who were standing in the elevator did not have auras, leading him to suspect the souls had already exited. 
This led me to imagine that perhaps the people who died in the train accident had the same experience as the survivors, that they felt the train speed up, then they passed out, and then they woke up to the scene I left in the dream, believing themselves to have survived. For there would be the wrecked train, the apartment building, the police cars, and the ambulances. They might not know what had happened until they realized that in the crowd of people who were waiting for them were relatives they had not seen for a very long time. So it would be a gentle transition. This dream was one of many such dreams I had during this time, and it took away my fear of death. I realized that things are not as they seem, and that each person is also being looked after in a very special way.